So Mira Nair, you're a film director, you're the marraine or the big sister of this year's Cinéma du Monde, the Cinema of the World workshop that's organised by the Institut Francais, which is a French institutional organisation that helps foster culture around the world. How do you see your role here this year at Cannes? Well, um, I'm very pleased to be here. Can, of course, was what launched me into the f craziness of the film industry with my own first film, Salam Bombay, about 30 years ago, uh, right here on these streets. And I came here with practically nothing, and it's wonderful to be here to work with filmmakers and the Institut Francais, uh, you know, with the La Fabrique, uh, to give them the kind of support uh, and understanding of how to navigate this mad industry that we are all in. So I, f I really do understand having come from the trenches myself and it's a great pleasure because I really believe that if we don't tell our own stories no one else will tell them for us and uh, what uh, La Fabrique has done is to bring filmmakers literally from all over from Bangladesh to Burkina Faso and that's why I'm here. You're also a person of, of the world, as it were, as well as world cinema. Um, you have a history with Uganda as well as with India. Yes. I'm born and raised in India and uh, very much uh, I'm an Indian uh, in, at home in the world. But uh, I, in 1989, when I went to research my second film, Mississippi Masala, uh, which was about the Asian expulsion from Uganda, to the whole world, uh, I fell in love and married a wonderful uh, Ugandan and, and have lived uh, in Kampala, Uganda uh, since 1990. Um, and in fact, uh, 15 years ago, founded a free film school there called Maisha, uh, which is now has 700 plus alumni and uh, very much the same idea as what La Fabrique is doing, which is to create you know voices and and excellence in craft so that they all can tell stories of where we come from because where we come from matters and of course nourishes the films that you make um, and also does being um, a woman nourish the films that you make we've been talking a lot here about the issue of women in cinema um, the charter that's been signed by the Cannes Film Festival 5050 by 2020 um, that may be easier to implement in management sectors of the film industry but perhaps not so easily and perhaps not desirable in for filmmakers and technical people well you know I am grateful for the movement to increase parity for sure because it is a long and uphill road uh, and I think a lot of it to, is to do with actually instilling confidence in, in young women and men from the age of the beginning from when you can learn and from when you can be asked and be shown that where you come from your language your poetry the, the, the dignity of the struggle of everyday life matters, you know. It's not just about one way of seeing the world, it's several ways of seeing the world. So, despite, you know, so with parity definitely uh, being a, a focus of ours, I still believe that the story is actually the most important. The story, the craft, the rigor, and the vision that a woman or a man bring to the subject, you know. Um, I'm grateful for the doors opening wider for women, for sure, because we have a lot to say and we have a very particular way sometimes of saying it, like any artists. But I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm one for the story. You know, I want to upheld, up, always uphold that standard. Even in my school in Maisha in, in East Africa, it's never to be apologist, oh, you know, because we're from the third world, we must be heard. Never. We must stand alongside uh, with excellence on every level um, and, and not really, uh, you know, rest on the fact that we come from a place that has not been heard of. What of filmmaking in India today? Is it a good place to make films today? Your kind of films? Films that talk about social issues, about history? Well, 
India is a very vigorous place for film. It's always been, but it's always been much more in a one kind of commercial mold till about, say, 20, 25 years ago when independent cinema, largely because distribution changed from the big, multi, from the big huge cinemas that was only one way you had to sell 1,500 seats per show to the multiplex, which is the smaller cinemas that allowed for an independent voice, maybe not the commerciality, but at least the availability of such cinema. And now, with uh, you know the streaming giants and with you know Netflix and and Amazon and and generally TV being so robust, uh, it has really increased the the vigor of what I see on screen. Also, you know that is a part of our uh, cinema that is not censored yet. So you know because of that freedom, uh, people really go all out, and it is pretty astonishing what I'm seeing. Um, is it? becoming polemical we have seen some films even in France recently mm -hmm. Lipstick Under My Burka mm -hmm. uh, La Crita mm -hmm. uh, Shiva Vasta mm -hmm. um, films like that that mm -hmm. are more edgy they're mm -hmm. bold anywhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, more films like that are coming out and not only from places like Bengal or Bombay well, actually, the most exciting cinema uh, is now coming out of uh, the Northeast, you know, Assam and, and that ne region, which is really fantastic because, you, you know, you, you know the cinema of the South and, of course, of Bombay and of Bengal. But it's very interesting uh, that Northeast is now really becoming something that we look to as exciting and new voices. Um, you know, it's all kinds of cinema. It is still didactic sometimes. It is still polemical. It is also extraordinary. My my friend Zoya Akhtar's movie Gully Boy is an astonishing piece of work. You know, that's the film that's just come out. It came out a few months ago. Yes, it's just come out. It's about rap. You know, and it's about the uh, extraordinary sort of voice coming out w of what is essentially a Muslim community in Bombay. Uh, that she sees in the most uh, exciting and human and not, you know, not in, oh, you know, often now with Islamophobia rage, raging so deeply across this world, alas. Um, it's often that, you know, Muslim characters are all suffered with this kind of schematic thinking, if you're Muslim, you must be this. And Zoya just blows away all that because this is a community that happens to be Muslim, that is a regular family that whose kid is a rapper and wants to be heard, you know. Um, and it's an extraordinary, lovely piece of cinema. So um, it's all kinds, uh, primarily because the audiences are younger and the audiences are demanding now of what they see in the rest of the world to be in their doorstep. We heard uh, just before the elections that there was a biopic mm -hmm. on the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. How political is Indian cinema today? Oh my goodness, I mean, uh, the right wing, I mean, has learnt the power of social media, you know, and the power of images to put forward their, their particular ethos, if you could even call it that. But, um, and um, so therefore these, these sort of die hard, you know, you can call them fans, you can call them whatever, uh, you know, are being, uh, you know, make these biopics that are so um, transparently about getting votes, you know, and increasing the sort of so-called heroism of, of our leaders. Um, it's the same with the politics between India and Pakistan in our, in our very, very, um, you know, overtly patriotic and I would say um, completely like twisted uh, sort of versions of stories, you know, just to build up the heroism of our country and so on. And completely propagandist things that are, are, are in our cinemas as well. So the fortunate thing is there is still a possibility to see a kaleidoscope, you know, and not just one form but sure I've never seen such uh, overt biopics happening so close to the election fortunately they've some of them have been shut down because it's it's completely uh, uh, you know not exactly the most ex you know it's, it's completely a, a way to tilt the public consciousness you know um, so that is being controlled some but very little it's still around yeah what projects are you working on at the moment? I understand you've got a very 
big, if not a mega yes. project going yeah. on. My goodness, sounds yes. uh, quite a, a bold move. Well, I am really delighted and actually honoured to make uh, A Suitable Boy, the great tome by Vikram Seth, um, about, uh, you, uh, and it's a fantastic uh, screenplay by Andrew Davies, who's a real master craftsman of the of the of the classic novels. He did War and Peace and Les Miserables and so on. But Vikram's novel I've loved ever since it was published. You know, it's uh, really about uh, India post-independence, you know, working towards its first democratic election. And through this wa vast sort of political sweep of its story is the intimate story of uh, a young uh, woman who whose mother insists on finding her a suitable boy. And as the country... Uh, finds its own voice through the election, the young woman finds her voice, you know, through either through her suitors or really essentially through herself. And that's a suitable boy. And it was in many ways what inspired me to create Monsoon Wedding. Um, and now I'm so happy to be made, to, I'm directing all six hours and and um, we just got greenlit and we are going to be shooting all across northern India uh, starting in September um, for several many weeks and months. Um, and it'll be out uh, in the, on television um, next June 2020. Um, Parallel in India, all over the uh, world. It's it's a BBC one, and it will be on BBC, and it will be hopefully with all the platforms that are sort of keen on it, wanting to have it. Uh, it will probably be around the world by that time. Um, it's a, just a absolutely, you know, I call it the crown in brown. Uh, you know, it has that kind of sweep and that kind of magnificence, but at its heart, it's a it's a beating heart. You know, it's an extraordinary humanist and sexy even tale uh, of uh, that is that is remarkably also timely because what uh, Vikram writes of the post-independent India and the fears after partition of this Hindu and Muslim divide is really sadly coming to pass today and um, I think that in making a suitable boy the way I'm going to make it in the contemporary way I'm going to make it um, I hope will speak to us all today as well um, in addition to A Suitable Boy, I've been developing for over nine years uh, a big Broadway-bound musical of my own film, Monsoon Wedding, uh, which will have its uh, world premiere at the Roundhouse Theatre in London in uh, July 2020. Not with the same cast? Uh, not with the same cast, because they have to sing, dance and act, but, uh, but an amazing cast, from uh, essentially from uh, India and uh, actually North American Indians as well. Um, and I love them so much that they are, a lot of them are going to also be in Suitable Boy. <laughs> so yeah, and a, a very yummy cast. Um, and it'll be uh, it'll open finally in London, and then we will bring it uh, to back to India and back to Broadway in New York. We'll all be booking front seats for that I one. I hope so. <laughs> and we hope that a Suitable Boy will also be seen on the big screen because it's it's such a big film. Yes, I, I really think of it as cinema, you know, and I hope to bring it here if they want me next year in Cannes. Um, and uh, I would love that because we will actually be absolutely finished in time for uh, May next year. And uh, th that's a dream and it's a lovely dream. But essentially, um, I would, l you know, just the fact that I'm making such an extraordinary piece of work that I've loved for so long is a total honor and a total privilege. Yeah. Mira Nair, thank you very much for speaking to us today. We wish you all the very best with thank your you. lovely project. And also have a wonderful time at the Cannes Film Festival. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Salam.